Um, so what I want to talk today about is how artificial intelligence is being used um, to, to improve patient outcomes, to um, improve productiv productivity and performance, and some of the things that leaders need to look at. At this particular presentation, I had more registrations than I've had for a long time. Now, some people will be here live, and if you are here, then great. Uh, hello, and you can ask me questions and interact as we go, and there'll be some other people who are watching the recording later. Um, and whether you're in healthcare or not, I think you'll get some value from this presentation. And uh, my three rules of engagement for all my presentations. Uh, I say, look, I, I want to give you things to think about. So um, if you can, remove any distractions and interruptions for the next hour that we've got together and spend some time thinking and think a little bit big. It's easier to think big now and then step it back later than to only think within what you'd normally do in your day-to-day -day role and then try to expand it when the world takes over. And um, the second thing is um, I encourage everyone to be a bit playful. So I've got a couple of little activities and exercises. You'll get the chance to ask me questions. And again, be playful in maybe doing things that you wouldn't uh, and thinking about things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And if you're here live and you've got the chance to have access to me for the next hour, please feel free to ask questions as well. And you can type them in the chat room and I will stop at specific times uh, to take your questions because I really want to give you things that you can take away and put into practice later. Okay, so AI, there's a lot of talk about AI and there's a lot of hype and noise about it. Uh, you might have seen this story a couple of weeks ago that said 40% of CEOs predict that AI is going to destroy humanity within the next decade. And there are these sort of stories like that about artificial intelligence. And um, I mean, they're rubbish. Ignore stories like this ignore them. And there's a few reasons for it. First of all, um, when he says 40% of CEOs, it's a tiny, tiny sample of CEOs, mostly North American CEOs. So it's certainly not representative of the world at large. And also, it's outside their area of expertise. So CEOs absolutely have expertise, but it's probably not that expertise. It's probably not uh, about the impact of AI on humanity. But I think the most important reason why you should ignore stories like this is whether you believe it's true or not, it's just not very useful. So for us now in 2023, thinking about the impact of AI, for us to even think about whether it's going to destroy humanity or not is not particularly useful. For us, it's more valuable to think about what can we do with AI now and what impact is it going to have in our short to medium term. So let me give you three facts. This is not speculation, three facts about AI, and, and I'll explain as we go through why these are facts. So the first one is that it's not new, and I'll give you examples of how AI has been around for a while and what impact it's already been having, even before ChatGPT uh, brought it to the mainstream and made everyone sit up and talk about it. The second thing is not hype. Well, I should say it's not all hype. So as I said, there, are, there is some hype around it, but it's not one of these speculative technologies. It's really mature. It's been around for a while. It's having a huge impact in a lot of areas, including healthcare. Uh, so it's definitely not hype. It is actually here and happening. Um, and the last thing is it is disruptive. It already is, and it's going to be disruptive. I tell people AI is going to be more disruptive than COVID, um, and in a positive and negative way. And the difference is with COVID, when we had this massive global di uh, disruption, uh, we felt it because it actually may have had an impact on us. We had restrictions, we had new rules, we had to use new technology. We didn't know what was coming up in the future and we could feel it. There was a physical impact of this deadly but invisible virus going around the world. With AI, again, it's invisible in, in many ways, but we don't necessarily see the impact of it, but it is, it is disruptive. And uh, I, I hope that I can show you some ways that you can leverage that today and that you don't just put it aside and say, this is not for me. I don't need to worry about this because you absolutely do, especially if you're a leader or a manager, you've got some very important responsibilities around AI. Um, five years ago, uh, I was talking about AI a lot. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, my stepdaughter, Abby, who she was studying at uni at the time, and she was doing some casual work for me just to um, earn a little bit of money on the side, um, helping me with some of my events and some of my admin. And a couple of weeks ago, she said to me, you know, Gihan, you've been talking about AI for years. Uh, why is 
everybody only starting to talk about it now. And I said, the difference is ChatGPT has been the tipping point. And now everybody knows they've got access to this free, public, open, awesome piece of technology. And they, they're now sitting up and saying, wow, this is here. I didn't realize it. But five years ago, when I was talking about the future of leadership, this is one of my slides from 2018. And I was saying at the time, I was saying, here we are, if we're thinking about what we need to think about as leaders for the future, I was saying 10 years ago, uh, which was 2008, that was the start of smartphones and social media, and technology was going to be a big driver for the future. Then five years later, it was all about when we first started having that conversation about skills versus jobs and careers. It's an ongoing conversation even now. And then in 2018, all the conversation, which was this when I was talking about this, was about the war for talent. How do you get and keep the best people? And I said at the time, in five years from now, AI will be the big thing that we need to think about. So that's here now. And I know some of my clients are here and you've already started that journey, which brings puts you a step ahead of many other people who are now just realizing it now. So AI is and has been around for a while. In fact, for me, uh, I've known about it for more than 30 years. When I graduated from the University of Western Australia uh, in the 1990s, uh, my, my uh, computer science thesis was about artificial intelligence. So even then we were talking about AI um, and I've been following it and been tracking it, seeing it grow and evolve. And Gartner, uh, five years ago, when they were doing Gartner's um, a technology company that um, a consulting company that tells but kind of predicts what technology is going to be big in the future. And every year they publish this hype cycle. And don't you don't have to read all that. You don't have to read in detail, but what they're doing is they're trying to predict what are the next big technologies. If you have a look at this graph, ignore most of it, but the the light blue dots are the areas that they think are going to be short-term impact. There's four of them on the graph, and um, you can see it here, and three of them are around AI. Three out of the four are around AI. So five years ago, Gartner was saying this is the next big thing, which it is, and it's turned out to be the case. Okay, so with that as a bit of a bit of a prelude and background, here are the three things I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about three things today um, in AI in the healthcare sector. So one is the, um, the impact of AI on improving patient outcomes. Uh, there, I know there are people here who are outside the healthcare sector. And in that case, think about what that means for instead of patients, it might be what's it mean for the customer experience of other stakeholders. I know there's some people from schools. So what does that mean for the, the school community and parents and the impact in that, in that area? And the, the next one is how do you bring your team along on the AI journey? This is for everybody, not just in healthcare. And the last area is what are some of the important governance issues, governance and leadership issues we need to be thinking about for, for using and integrating AI in our businesses and in our organizations. Okay, so those are broadly the three areas I want to look at today. And um, let's look at, let's do a little bit of interaction. So I've got a question for you, which is really about you know, if you think about AI in healthcare, what comes to mind? Yes, so thank you for that. Um, so it's really good. And it's great to see there's a lot around efficiency. Um, there's, uh, there's opportunities here. And it's actually, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, is AI as an assistant can help us. There's less admin, fewer mistakes, greater productivity. In fact, I have a slide about productivity, which I wasn't necessarily going to show, but I will show that now. Um, and it's, it, the, there's one in green down near the bottom left that says more time for caring. And that's right. And I think you'll find that AI um, takes away some of the burden from us, like the drudgery or the admin, and it gives us more time to do what our core competencies are. In healthcare, a big part of that's caring, but even at a leadership level, it gives us more time to think about high level things around strategy and so on. So I, I want to give you, I don't want to tell you all about AI and how it works, but there's one really useful thing to understand is that there are two kinds of artificial intelligence. And it's the, this is going back a little bit into the past, but it kind of will uh, demonstrate how AI is growing in the future. So the two kinds are expert systems and machine learning. So 
expert system, and most AI now is a combination of the two, but it used to be very heavily focused on expert systems, and now it's moved more towards machine learning. So when I was back in uni 30 years ago doing AI, um, a lot of the AI we were doing was about, was building an expert system. So that, as the name implies, is that you talk to an expert and try to model their thinking processes to in software. So in healthcare, if you wanted to talk to an AI software to do cardiology or even surgery, you talk to somebody like this, Dr. Nikki Stamp, who's one of Australia's leading cardiothoracic surgeons. You sit down with Nikki and say, what do you do? First of all, when you see, a, a, see an image, uh, what do you look for? And you go, oh, there's this cloudy bit here. And then you say, okay, what do you do when you see what size do you may take this action on? What size of the cloud do you take this action on? And you kind of build this decision tree and then program the program software that will go through this massive series of decisions the same way that an expert human would. Now, that's still built into many, much of the AI now, but that's not how most AI works now. Most AI works now with machine learning. So if you're trying to teach a computer to play chess really well, the expert system way is that you program it with all the games that have been played in the past between chess grandmasters. So that when he sees a situation, it says, oh, this grandmaster played this in 1929 at this competition. So I'm going to play that because it's likely to lead to a win. That's not how it works now. So Google, when Google programmed its AI to learn to play chess, it very quickly became better than the world's best chess players. And what Google did was it simply told uh, the, the software the rules of chess, and it would then make um, and then said play. So the first move that the uh, computer made, it was it picked one of the legal moves available and picked one of them at random and made the move. And then the, the opponent would reply, pick another move at random and play and play and play and play and play. And what would happen at the end? It would probably lose. But then it would go back and each of the moves it made in that situation, it would slightly penalize them so that the next time it played and found itself in that situation, it could still make that move, but it was a little bit less likely to do that. So it would do it again, it would, it would lose. And it would go back and penalize every time it lost, it penalized the moves that it made. Every time it won, it would reward the moves that it made. And over time, and this is a computer, so you could play over and over and over again, you can play millions of games, it learned a strategy. It actually didn't know, didn't understand chess, but it knew that in a particular position, the best move to make probabilistically was the one that has le had led to wins in the, um, in the past. And what you do is you get two computers playing against each other and you just leave it to them. And they, they very, very quickly, within a matter of days, the computer was better than the best chess players, human chess players on earth. So this is how most AI works now. It works by this machine learning. So if you've used ChatGPT and you've been amazed at how amazing it is, it's because it's done this kind of learning. It's done this machine learning. It swallows up a whole bunch of information. And then when you ask it a question, it doesn't really understand what you're asking, but it's trying to predict what's the next best thing for it to give you a next best string of words uh, to spit out. And that becomes your response. So that's how a lot of AI works now. And it's going to work that way in the future as well. The other really interesting thing that's happened in AI now is that a lot of AI until now has been internal. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. So AI for healthcare, for doing diagnosis, for doing um, staff management, for doing a whole bunch of things. You had to have an AI system within your organization. But now with ChatGPT, uh, we've now got access to free and low cost external AI tools that can help us in a lot of ways. Okay, so let's look at the first of those ways. And this is about patient outcomes. So improving their experience. And I'm not necessarily only talking about clinical outcomes, but it could also be about improving the patient experience. So I've got some um, examples for you here that uh, where AI is already being used. In 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, Oracle did some research and they interviewed employees around the world and they said, how are you coping? How are you coping? And uh, probably it wasn't surprising that most people said, the majority of people said, this is the worst year we've ever had. Not surprising for most people. It was the first time they've been in a, in a global pandemic. But what was surprising was that, they, that you know, two thirds of people said they would rather talk about their mental health issues, the stress and the anxiety to AI than to a human. 
And uh, I remember posting this story on LinkedIn in 2020 when it first came out. And um, that, in my little corner of the universe, blew up my LinkedIn feed. I had you know, hundreds of comments and, and dozens of, uh, sorry, uh, 20,000 plus uh, um, views on that on that post and there was a lot of controversy about it some people said uh, there's no way that AI could be as good as what we do as mental health professionals there were others who said oh maybe we should be looking into this and there were others who were going well duh we're already using two AI tools to help in this area so these are ordinary people who are who have already been using AI and remember this is even before chat GPT and the following year uh, Oracle did the same survey, again, with the same sort of group of people, and again, similar results. And one other result that came out in 2021 was that four out of five people, four out of five people, said they would trust AI with helping them with their career plan more than they would trust their manager, the HR or career counselors. So these are ordinary people, not normal people using AI. These are not IT people. These are not leaders and managers thinking about the strategic impact of AI. These are ordinary people who say, you know, we, we understand the value of AI and they know that AI is kind of, it's just normal. It's so AI is Siri on your phone. It's uh, Google Maps navigating you somewhere. It's Netflix uh, recommending the next thing for you to watch uh, in your playlist. It's Spotify recommending songs to add to your playlist. So we're using AI every day. And most people are used to that. And this is organizations are taking a while to catch up. So let me give you some examples of AI that's currently being used in healthcare for improving patient outcomes and patient experience. And when I started preparing this, I found there, 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 there are literally thousands of examples, but even breaking them down into categories, there were more than 20 categories of um, AI being used in healthcare. And I'm only going to show you eight of them here. And I'll show them to you, and then I'll stop and see if you've got any questions about them. So as I go through this, um, these eight examples, think about what questions you have. You can even type them in the chat room as I'm presenting the eight if you want to, and then I'll quickly stop and answer some of them for you. Okay, I'll do this. I'll make this a bit bigger so you can see. And just remember, these are just eight areas out of many, out of dozens. So the first one is AI for research and for drug discovery. It's being used to, to create new drugs. It's being do, used in research in like protein folding, like really complex problems it can do very quickly. So it's actually being used in, the, in that area. And just last week, I think the first AI created drug has been approved by the, um, by the FDA in the USA for use. Uh, so it's been uh, approved for human clinical trials. So it hasn't quite gone to the public yet, but it's almost at that stage now. Um, and this is going to be a big area in the future, AI for drug discovery and, um, and creating medicines. The second one's around diagnosis. So um, this example here is uh, an AI, it's an app that you just talk into and based on your voice patterns, it can do early diagnosis of um, Alzheimer's. So um, how does it do that? Well, just by pattern matching in the same way that, as it learned how to play chess. It doesn't really understand chess strategy, but it understands from millions and millions of patterns, which of them um, uh, could possibly lead to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And the next one is around robots. So these are AI powered robots. These are micro robots. I remember probably about I think about 10 years ago, there were these, uh, this, oh, what are the, the remote surgery robots? Um, the names uh, slips from my, oh, Da Vinci, the Da Vinci robots at the time, where surgeons could do remote surgery, where they, they manipulate in one area, and there's a robot somewhere else that's doing the surgery. Um, but that's not really AI, because that's humans controlling it. The examples of AI and robotics now are like this. These are these micro robots that you inject into the human body, and they go around and they grab, they look for, and they grab, say, cancer cells, and drag them to another part of the body so that you can then do um, this easy easy to do treatment on them. That's just one example of AI being used um, in robotics in healthcare. Uh, here's another example. This is patient admin. So we're all used to now, if we're um, booking an appointment, uh, you don't necessarily have to ring up. You can book um, on, on a website. And that's just, that's not particularly clever AI because it's just saying what times are available in the calendar. But it's also being used in other areas like um, predicting um, based on previous behavior, which patients are likely to miss an appointment, and therefore it might be 
prudent to have um, have a, a double book, so book somebody else for that time, or uh, how long an appointment should be booked for and how much time should be allowed uh, based on pre previous patient behavior. Um, yeah, so it's being used in admin areas to help patients with their admin and also uh, help the people in healthcare as well to be more efficient there. Uh, cyborgs. So cyborgs are humans which are who are augmented by machines. Uh, so I wonder, I don't see many people with their cameras on now. How many people here are cyborgs? So I'm one. So I'm a human who has, who has augmented my vision with a little bit of a, with a little bit of a machine. Uh, this example here goes a level further, where uh, you could wear augmented reality glasses and you see somebody speaking, and there's AI that's powering those glasses that will pop up uh, like a cartoon speech bubble, uh, so that you can read what they're saying. So it's really useful for people uh, who have hearing difficulties. Uh, in education and training, AI is being used in many ways. This is an example here. You can't see the picture very well, but the example here is um, people being trained on the wards, and the, the patient is actually a hologram, and the, the trainees are wearing virtual reality glasses, and the hologram is behaving in certain ways, and then the uh, trainees have to, um, have to deal with that. There's an example in Australia, uh, which is being used in midwifery, where nurses who are being trained in... Um, uh, assisting the childbirth, there's a robot uh, on the uh, on the bed, on the hospital bed, and the robot is programmed in various ways to have to have complications in childbirth, and then the nurses and the midwives learn how to deal with those in a in a safe environment. Um, this one, this this one here is actual treatment being done through AI. So this is in physio, in physiotherapy, you wear these bands, and you've got an AI app on your iPad and is taking you through a program uh, of physio without a human being there. So a human might have set up the program and it might be a rehab program, but it's actually the AI that's um, that's actually running the program. And because the, the client is wearing the bands, the AI can respond to what's happening in real time, just as a, as a human therapist would do as well. Um, and this last area here is around facilities management. So this is uh, this is AI software that's monitoring the CCTV cameras in the wards and looking at movement that's happening in wards. And there's some normal movement, of course, but it can also look for abnormal movement, like somebody falling or somebody wandering out, a patient wandering out of the ward when they shouldn't be. And then it'll alert humans to come in um, to um, yeah, take notice of that. In the same way as many smart homes work now, and there's a big push in aged care for people to live in the community, so live in their homes, but with smart devices that will monitor what they're doing uh, so that they can alert people if there's a change to behavior. So if you know that uh, somebody's gonna be turning on their kettle at the same time each day, roughly the same time, and one day they don't, the AI software can, can notify family or carers or um, yeah, an ambulance if it, if it becomes a serious situation. So these are just some, a few examples, and I've picked eight here, but I've gone broad here. So there's some in allied health, some in mental health, some in hospital settings, uh, some for private practices. So this is quite broad. Uh, has, anyone, has anyone got any questions about them? about any of those here. This is a chance, given that you're here live, uh, to ask me questions about any of these. And I, I don't mind what sort of questions you ask, and I'll do my best to answer them now. One of the concerns, uh, this is your minister, uh, one of the concerns that normally pops up in any implementation uh, in healthcare, not talking about AI, but anything else, is the safety patient safety and uh, we can probably uh, look back at automotive industry where we've got AI all around the place. We've got cars who are actually much safer than human driving, but we can't replace them because uh, humans still drive. And uh, that's the question here. Uh, what would be the uh, legal implications, risk management implications from the use of AI, especially in healthcare where human life would depend on an algorithm? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And it's like, like I'll, I'll pick one of the examples. So there's, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to the governance section later, but I'll, I'll tackle one example here now. Um, so th there's safety, there's privacy, 
and there's some ethical issues about AI as well. For example, in that patient admin example that I showed you earlier, that I talked about earlier, where you kind of you're predicting whether a patient is going to be a no-show, and therefore maybe you should um, uh, double book that appointment with somebody else. Well, the AI around that can be biased because based on um, patients and socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic status, maybe they're less likely to, it's harder for them to get time off work, it's harder for them to take public transport to get to an appointment. So the AI will then say the next time, they, uh, the next time they're booked, um, maybe double book. But if they turn up and they find that their appointment is um, booked by somebody, it's already been taken by somebody else, then they, it discriminates them against them again. So this, there's a, there's a question around, like I know Luria asked a question about safety, but there's also the question about bias as well. And all of these issues are really important. So privacy, safety, and ethics are three of the biggest areas that leaders have to manage in any industry, in any sector, but particularly in, cell, um, in healthcare. And one of the challenges that we're facing with AI is because AI is learning by itself, it's sometimes unable to explain why it made certain decisions. So in like the, I go back to the chess example, when an AI plays chess better than a human expert, it actually doesn't know about chess. So when I play chess and I'm nowhere near grandmaster level, I know things like you open a file, you open a row that makes it, gives you some strength and power if you have a rook or you have a diagonal and you've got a bishop. And I know those sort of things. The AI doesn't necessarily, um, it knows that kind of intuitively because of patterns, but it can't explain it. So there's some talk now about AI in the future. Decisions have to be explainable. So there's going to be a layer built on AI. Um, governments around the world are looking at this that says you can't release an AI unless you've, unless it's, first of all, it's gone through safety uh, and also it's got explainability built on top of it so that we can then inspect an AI decision and decide whether that's actually what we want or whether it was based on bad data. So it's a problem at the moment, but it's one of the things that uh, governments around the world are looking at, how do we build more safety and um, particularly explainability onto AI. Uh, this is probably something that would limit the use of AI because one of the things with AI that it can be much smarter, put it this way, as humans cannot appreciate how AI has arrived to that specific decision because That's it right. uses other ways. So any dis any decision explanation might be irrelevant from the human perspective so that's not uh, yeah it, it might be different but I, I think at the moment we've got to be very careful about using ai for decision making we should definitely be using ai for decision assistance okay because that that's a safer way of, so i I'm, I'm saying at the moment we should be using ai as an assistant not as a uh, decision maker for us um, another example so i was talking to a group of school leaders recently and one of them as a school principal said i used ai to draft my um start of term newsletter to parents and he did about 80 percent of the job well um, but he couldn't do the other 20 percent and then somebody else in the room said well could you do it could you get the ai to write that for you in french and so we went to chat GPT and said rewrite this in french and he did immediately but then he said well is the french version is it good french or is it too colloquial or is it right and i said this is where you you don't rely on the AI for that. In the same way as you use the AI to start by doing the 80% of the work for you, you don't want to, you have to add your intelligence on top of that for the last 20%. And at the moment, that's the way we should be using AI. Okay, I see some other questions coming in. Steve says privacy and confidentiality. Absolutely, ex this is exactly the, pro uh, the challenges that we're facing at the moment, Steve, not only in, like, I know you're in education, but not only in healthcare, but everywhere and their questions about privacy and confidentiality with AI. So yeah, and we'll, we'll cover those a little bit later when we look at the governance area. Um, Derek says, I work with older patients. How do they take up AI or trust? Yeah, this is really interesting. So I'm part of a, uh, I'm part of this uh, aged care advisory group that gets together and provides some advice to the WA state government about, um, you know, it, it's, um, about aging. It's about aged care more broadly. And the last session that we had a month ago was about the digital divide, saying that older Australians possibly have less 
um, access to technology and less familiarity with technology, yeah, you know, speaking broadly. But AI is one area where it can actually speed up and simplify these things. So, for example, people using Siri can talk to their phone rather than, than having to navigate a whole bunch of apps and websites and, uh, and clicks and those sort of things which don't come naturally. So some of that AI is actually going to make the interface with technology easier to use. Um, some of it's not at the moment, so you wouldn't necessarily expect everybody to know how to use ChatGPT to do something like plan a meal for my plan my meals for the week based on what's in my fridge. Some people can, but you wouldn't expect everyone to do that. But in some ways, AI is actually going to make things easier than harder, and not everywhere. And we need to be careful about that about the digital divide. Um, Georgina, we need to validate AI outcomes and responses with human knowledge and expertise. Yeah, Georgina, exactly. So what, again, I say, use it as a smart assistant. So you've got an assistant that you can get to do some of the grunt work, some of the drudgery work, some of the go and get this research for me and then give it to me. But then you need to validate it um, uh, and then add your human intelligence on top of it. Good, good. And some of these questions are going to come up again. Uh, so feel free to ask them again later when we talk about governance uh, governance and some of these issues around that. I've got a whole section around risks, problems and challenges coming up soon. OK, let's look at this second area. And this is actually looking internally. How do you bring your people along on the AI journey? And I've given you some examples already about how people are comfortable with AI, like the tools that we're using on our smartphones and our, and our tablets, um, as well as doing things like AI for career advice and uh, and for mental health assistance. Uh, and coming back to what we said earlier, AI and humans together are better than either of them alone. And I'd say it's essential that, you, that it's uh, AI and humans together, not one or the other. And again, coming back to this idea that some things are internal, some things are external. External things are like ChatGPT. And until ChatGPT came along, much of the AI that people were using was very self-contained. So you could talk to Siri on your iPhone, or you'd use Google Maps or Apple Maps, but there's not much you could do apart from getting that information. ChatGPT now uh, allows people to, it kind of, escapes. It's, it's created a portal to AI that can be used in, in somewhat risky ways. And um, you know, are, are the people in your team already using AI? And you may know, you may not know, uh, very, uh, very early on after ChatGPT was launched, this piece of research came out that said that two thirds of people are using tools like, well, in this case, ChatGPT, without even telling their bosses about it. And you could go, well, how could they do that? Like this AI tools are supposed to be used internally, uh, but because ChatGPT is an external tool, and so many people were using that, mainly for things like um, doing a lot of the assistance work that we talked about um, for productivity and performance. So um, actually, I'm going to tell you about my my, my own masterclass that I run. I'll tell you about that at the end. But if you look at the, the last line of this, what I promise is you spend half a day with me and you'll gain an hour a day of productivity from then on, like immediately, get immediate value from learning how to use ChatGPT and other tools like that. And the sort of things that um, you can get, uh, I'll show you this here. So this is, this is, these are some of the things that, um, and I know I'm talking to a leadership group here, so leaders and managers, some of the things that leaders and managers can use an AI assistant for to improve their productivity and, and their performance. So just have a look at that list and say, and just say to yourself, am I spending more than an hour a day on any one of these things? So it's not attending meetings, because maybe AI is not going to attend meetings on your behalf, but note-taking at meetings, um, email managing your email, uh, so AI can do a lot of that, uh, even scheduling the meeting, um, doing expense reporting, doing travel planning, and so on. So are you doing those sort of things? And if you had an AI to do that, how much time would that save for you? And these are the sort of things, these are kind of quick wins with AI that you can do without having to implement, say, a hospital-wide AI ward monitoring system. So these are some of the things but that people that you can get people on your team to do straight away, to do right away, right now. 
I don't want to go through this in any detail here, but I just want to show you some of the scope of what is possible. I'll give you one example. So I was working with a client a couple of weeks ago, and they spend a lot of time. They have to read all these reports, and they have to digest them, and even summarize them, and then share them with other people in their in their team. Um, this is not PwC, by the way. They're not taking material that they're not allowed to take, uh, but they're, they're gathering a lot of material from outside, and then they have to summarize and distill it. Um, so I showed them there's a there's a way of using chat GPT for that. And the example that I used was, um, so I've been talking about this whole idea of uh, hybrid work and working away from uh, the office and so on for a long time. And um, some years ago, almost 15 years ago now, my friend Chris Padney and I wrote this book, Out of Office, which is all about how to work away from an office. So you have that kind of hybrid work. Uh, it's, it's out of date now, it's out of print because the technology is out of date. But I'd use this as an example. So there, if you use ChatGPT, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret with ChatGPT, which many people don't know. If you've got the paid version of ChatGPT, and I think you should, I think everyone here in this room, I would highly recommend that you spend the, it's basically a dollar a day. It's about the cost of my KO subscription to watch the cricket. I get access to the paid version of ChatGPT. It's got these plugins. And these plugins will enhance the value of the free version. It's like your iPhone. If you, if you couldn't install any apps on your iPhone and you only had what Apple gave you, Apple's own apps or the Google uh, Android phones, Google's own apps, it would be much less powerful. So you can add these plugins. This one here is called Show Me. So I can, with that plugin, I can say to ChatGPT, I'm going to upload a chapter of my book. I could have actually done the whole book and create a summary for me. And then it creates a diagram. Okay, and it turns this into a, an, a summary of that chapter. And I've read it through, it's pretty good, pretty good. And then you can edit the diagram because it's opened up in some other software, which allows you to edit, edit the diagram. So that's just one example of how AI can be used to save a lot of time, a huge amount of time, simply by um, simply by summarizing, uh, by again, consuming large volumes of text and summarizing it. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's just one example of uh, AI as a productivity booster. Now, the challenge is when you start using that with your team, then, um, uh, who's this, Steve? So you asked a question about privacy and confidentiality. People are uh, uploading private and confidential information to chat GPT um, without really thinking, uh, in good faith, without thinking about it, but they're just thinking, this is really useful. I might just use this. Um, so how do you get your people on side with this. So you can definitely set some rules and policies and training, but that alone is not enough. This technology is moving so fast that you've got to be able to trust people's judgment. Um, yeah, Gina says copyright as well. So there's a point at which you have to say, how, how are we going to trust our team members to do this properly? And I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, let me do a little bit of a demonstration here um, with, a, with a little story. So a couple of I'm interested. I wonder how many people have ever taught a young person how to drive. So I did this recently, a couple of years ago, um, when my my now 18 year old step um, uh, niece Abby, uh, when she was 16 and she was learning how to drive, she came to me and asked me whether I'd help her. And I think sometimes it's better not having the parent as the driving instructor. So I helped her. So my first 12, uh, her first 12 first hours of, of driving, first 12 hours of driving was with me. And I took her out and um, we, we learned in my car. And uh, it's almost exactly a year ago now that she sent me this text when she passed her test saying, I can drive. Um, but it taught me something really interesting because we take driving for granted now, but there are stages that you go through. So I'm going to do this little activity um, and if you can help me make Perth Road safer, safer. So this is a bit of an interactive activity. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you four situations that Abby and I came across when we were doing driving, when she was doing driving lessons with me. And I'm going to ask you what we need to do in each situation. Okay, so let me do this quite quickly. Let me I'll draw this out for you. Okay, so first situation is this. So this is a two-way road, Abby's car is green. Abby's always going to be the green car. And she was turning right into this road here. There was another car here that was stopped at this stop sign and also wanted to turn right. So we all know uh, that we're... Uh, so we drive on the left-hand side of the road in Australia. I'm just saying for the people who are watching this from Europe later, because I know there, there are some. So it's a two-way road here. We all know that what we should do 
is move out here, make sure there's no traffic coming this way, and then when it's safe, we can turn right. But Abby, and this is the second time out on the road, she was hanging back here, and I said, Abs, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I know I'm supposed to give way to the right, and this car's on my right. And she didn't realize that because she was on the continuing road, she had right of way. So what does Abby need to know to not make that mistake again? So can you type in the chat room what you think Abby needs? Just do it in the chat. Okay, you can say you can type in the chat to everyone if you want to, but yes, it's it's uh, it's information, right? So it's like learn the book uh, indicates. So she's indicating, but she didn't have. So she needed information. Uh, so she actually knew this, like she actually had read the book and did did understand it. But you know, this is the second time she was out there operating heavy ma machinery in public, so she kind of forgotten it. So, but basically, it was information. Okay, situation number two, roundabout. So this time there was only Abby, so it's only one car, so it makes the roundabout a little bit easier, and she had to go around this way. And she knew that what she had to do was um, make sure there's no nobody coming from the right here, and she would get onto the roundabout, in, um, indicate right, um, and then when she got to this point, she'd indicate left, say that she was leaving at the next intersection. But because this was only about her fourth or fifth lesson, like she knew that like she's holding the steering wheel, she knew how to indicate, but it was a little bit clumsy because she's kind of holding it so the wheels still turn and trying to indicate. And uh, she was driving my car, which is a European car, so the indicator was on a different side than when we were doing it in her mum's car. So she was a little bit clumsy doing that. So what does Abby need to be able to do that more effectively? Practice. Yep, Catherine, exactly right. Okay, so let me call it skill. So she has information, she just needs a skill to do it. Third situation here. Um, this is a this is a one-way road. Okay, but it's got two lanes that are merging into one. So Abby's here. There's another car around here. And this is merging into, sorry, this should be a single lane over here, it was two lanes, and they're going to merge into one. Now, Abby knows that if this car is back here, she's confident enough, she's done enough driving, that she's happy to go ahead. She indicates to say that she's coming in to merge, but she's quite about confident enough to do that. If the other car's here, like lined up or just a little bit behind or ahead, she's also happy to just sit back and let the other driver go ahead. Um, it says no one in Perth can merge. You're right. You're right. But it's this tricky situation, like maybe around here, where the cars are pretty close. She's not sure whether to go ahead or whether she should hang back and let the other car go. But if she waits, then the other car is going to get impatient waiting for her to go. So what does she need to be able to do that more effectively? Confidence? Yep, absolutely confidence. But, um, but you can be confident and still make the wrong decision. So I reckon this comes down to judgment. But there's not necessarily a right answer to this. Sometimes it's a judgment call. And you're right, Derek, so it's, a, it's experience. And experience helps you build a good judgment. Okay, final situation. This is a complicated, it's a complex situation, which actually Abby didn't have to do in the end, but she heard from many of her mates that uh, this is a very common situation that the examiner will put you through when you go for your driving test. So this is a two-way street. Um, Yes, this car's going in both directions. Uh, for people in Perth, this is Wellington Street in Perth. Subiaco is in this direction, Perth's in this direction. The um, licensing centre is down here. So this is a very common situation that um, students are put into. So Abby is here. And she's turning right. And the examiner's asked her to turn right across traffic. There's traffic coming from both directions traffic here, there's traffic here. There's a bit of a hill here. So it's difficult for her to see the cars coming from this side and there are cars parked around here. So it's it really uh, makes it difficult for her to see when she's just parked the stop sign. Okay, the examiner's asked her to turn right here. What should she do? What does she need to know? I was doing this for a group in Queensland and uh, one of the participants said, just floor it and hope for the best. Okay, but let's assume it's not that. Uh, what does Abby need here? Oh, okay. I think people are stumped. I reckon if it was, oh, I should tell you, first of all, the thing that she should do in that situation, if it was a test, is she should definitely stop, 
at the stop sign, as Gina says, yeah, patience, and say, and then say to the examiner, I can't see, so I'm going to just nudge forward a little bit so that the examiner doesn't think that she's going to just zoom out into, uh, into traffic. And you do that, right? Like if, if this was a situation and you had no other choice, this is what we do. Stop and then nudge out and be patient. Um, Derek says improvise or, and I think Derek's uh, right. So what I would do or what many of us would do is if you say, no, 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 it's too difficult. We're going to turn left and then find a place somewhere else here where we can turn around. Or if you know that there's a Collins Street is down here and they're the Collins Street traffic lights, you can come around here and come here where you can turn right the lights and do it in a safe way. Okay, so really this situation here, you have to have the wisdom to understand the big picture. And sometimes the wisdom says, no, don't do this. Like we'll get out of this situation or don't get into that situation. And sometimes it's not appropriate. And I think when we're thinking about, this is actually about building trust with our team members in general, but specifically with AI, quite often it's one of these four things that you want to build for your, for your team. Do they have the information? Do they actually have the tools and the resources? Do they have access to chat GPT? Have you paid for a paid subscription? Um, you don't have to, but you know, do they have the tools? Then do they have the skills to use those tools? Have they got the teacher, the training, the coaching, the mentoring, a safe environment to experiment in? And then do you give them the experience so that they can build good judgment in using the AI tools? A good judgment with chat GPT would be something like, I've asked ChatGPT for 15 ways that AI is being used to di uh, for diagnosis in healthcare. I get back 15 examples. I need to check them, fact check them myself. There are other things where I go, I don't need to fact check them. So that's where judgment comes in. And the last situation is, uh, do I have to, like uh, there's some situations where I don't use AI. It's wise for me, even though I know I can, I shouldn't. So look at building those things in your team. And if you don't trust them yet, to use AI effectively. Um, can I say that's on you? That's your fault, not theirs. So that's what you want to build up with your team. Okay, so I've, like, I've done, that ex I've done that example in a, in a bit of detail, because I think this is so important that a lot of leaders now are thinking about how could we create an AI policy? It's a good thing to do, but the policy alone is not enough because the technology is moving so fast and you can't put everything into a hard and fast policy. So you really need to build judgment with your team members. Actually, now let's, let's move on to this third area because people did ask questions about uh, governance and leadership. And there, I'll, I'll give you some guidance here into some of the leadership questions you should be, uh, questions you should be asking as a leader to create things like uh, policy and governance. Uh, I know there's some people here from, uh, from schools, so prin school principals and school leaders. And I'm running, if you're in Western Australia, if you're in Perth, I'm running a workshop around AI for leaders, around uh, for leadership and government. So this is ASWA members. If you're a member of the um, Association of Independent Schools in WA, there's a workshop coming up in September, and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail. But these, these sort of questions apply, not just to uh, healthcare or education, but they absolutely apply everywhere. And there are a lot of risks and problems and challenges. So this session, this, uh, this last five minutes of uh, this section is brought to you by Hanrahan, because people are looking at what could go wrong? And that's absolutely right. When you're thinking about governance, some of that should be about what could possibly go wrong. So here's, here's a list of 20 um, risks, problems, or challenges with um, implementing AI in your organization or with your team. Um, can you, I'm going to ask you for, to ask me some questions about this, and I'm happy to answer them. I'll give you, I'll, I'll put this slide back on in a sec, but I'll give you an example of how this happened in real life. So soon after ChatGPT was launched, uh, Samsung, it's one of the smartest tech companies in the on the planet, has some of the smartest engineers, they uploaded, Samsung programmers uploaded some of their software to ChatGPT to ask for advice. And it gave some really good advice, but the engineers didn't think about the fact that they were uploading proprietary Samsung software to ChatGPT and the owners of ChatGPT now had access to this because that's part of their terms of use. So Samsung banned the engineers from using ChatGPT, but they're now building their own version of essentially ChatGPT that the engineers can use safely. 
Um, here's another example. This happened recently. Uh, a lawyer used uh, ChatGPT to, uh, to write a brief that was submitted to court, but ChatGPT had made up some of the, some of the um, cases that he cited. And uh, this lawyer was amazed. He was horrified. He goes, I didn't understand that ChatGPT could completely fabricate cases. And he got up pretty lightly, actually, last week. Um, he was fined $5,000, but it could have been a lot more serious. Um, in the education sector, there's uh, like some people are trying to ban AI, but there's this one lecturer in the US who said, um, I want to teach my students how to use AI. And he got his students to do an assignment using ChatGPT and then to evaluate uh, how well it did that job. And he found that every one of his 63 students, all of the essays had what's called hallucinated information. So when AI lies and um, the the AI advocates call it hallucination, but it completely made up stuff or had incorrect sources or using sources, real sources, but in the wrong way and so on. Um, so there's some problems. There's some problems with uh, the use of AI. So let me give you these uh, 20 challenges again. And let me just quickly ask you, is there anything that you'd like me to cover that I didn't cover earlier? I know some of these questions came up earlier, but if there are any other questions around this, um, these are some of the some of the challenges that we are all facing now as leaders when using AI in our organizations. And then I'll give you a couple of resources that are really useful that'll, that'll help you, um, you know, formulate how you, as a leadership team and an organization, you're going to deal with AI. Okay, so the comment about teachers now, now running assessments from zero GPT or the like and pinning the students for using it. Yeah, so there are AI detection tools like um, that, the education sector, some schools and universities are using them, but they're not very good. I can tell you now that if you are in the education sector and you're using anti-plagiarism tools, um, like Turnitin, um, which was previously not AI powered, but now is, so wasn't detecting AI, but now detects AI as well. Zero GPT is another one. Um, they're just not very good at the moment. And uh, unfortunately, students are being caught by that. There's one lecturer in the US who, um, he, he took all his student essays, uploaded them to ChatGPT, and he said they were all uh, generated by AI wrongly. So he failed the class. They couldn't graduate. But the, he was wrong. And the, it's just because he didn't understand uh, ChatGPT's limitations. Um, yeah, Alex, about amplifying biases. So that's um, number three on that list. So it, it, that's like the example I gave earlier. Like if there's a, if there's a bias, then AI can operate from that bias and can amplify that bias. As an example, in human resources, so Amazon some years ago, probably about seven or eight years ago now, uh, was using AI to try and earmark and identify people for promotion, so the people who would make the best leaders. And because the data they, was working at, they were working on was Amazon's data from the past, the people they were recommending for leadership positions were, surprise, surprise, uh, white men. OK, because that was what the past said. These were the people who were leaders. And so you promote more white men to leaders and then the AI learns from that. And then you get more white men as leaders and then it builds on that bias and it continues to perpetuate and amplify that bias. Um, Gina says doesn't always have recent data. That's right. Um, the newer versions of AI um, and ChatGPT, that the, the paid version, can have access to uh, the most current data. But you're, you're right. So number 13, out of date data is a problem. Um, as Georgina says, with healthcare outcomes, there's uh, even like we know that a lot of healthcare research and clinical trials have already been biased. They've been biased against women because in the past it was thought that women were, um, they weren't strong enough and they were too feeble to be included in trials. So trials were mostly done on men and then said, well, it's obviously going to be the same for women. Uh, or we know there's, uh, there's bias in a lot of bias in healthcare in the US against um, African-Americans, and they don't necessarily get the same level of healthcare. They're not trusted as much when they're describing symptoms. So those sort of biases, if they're built into the, uh, what actually happens and AI then learns from that, those biases are going to be perpetuated. Okay, so there, um, these, are, these are some really important challenges that um, leaders have to face. And you can see most of these here are not only about healthcare, but some of them are particularly acute in healthcare. Let me give you a couple of resources. Let me give you a couple of resources that will help you with this. 
So um, there's an HBR article that was published in the most recent issue of the Harvard Business Review, uh, which was 13 principles for using AI responsibly. It's a good start. So if you have access to HBR, and if you don't, you get a, free a few free articles every month. So just search for that title. And, and those 13 principles are a good start. They're not everything you need, but they're a good start. Uh, also, you can go to my website, gihanperera.com, and there's an online self-assessment that's, uh, are you ready for AI? It asks you these 16 questions, you rate yourself, and um, it's, done, it's done online. So as soon as you finish, it will email you a personalized report based on your responses with some suggestions. So um, please do that. There's no cost to that. It takes about five minutes to do, and you get a report, which is, again, a good start for you designing some policies and how you're going to use AI in your organization and team. Okay, so just to wrap up, we've talked about AI for improving the patient experience. We've talked about bringing your team on side by building their judgment so that they don't have to rely on rules and policies. And we've talked about some other things you might want to put into your rules and policies. Um, I mentioned this earlier, my AI at Work Masterclass. So this is a half day masterclass, um, roughly half a day, and it's very practical. So people come along with their laptops, they um, do some demonstrations, they do some things themselves to try and figure out how to use AI effectively. It's in person or online. I kind of like the online version. So when I do it online, um, what we do is we split it up into two sessions. So we do one session first where I teach them th things and then they have four to six weeks to have a bit of a break and they they each identify a project that they're going to work on in their time and then the second session they come back report and need to ask me questions get additional resources it's really valuable because they actually practice what they're doing before they come back for the second session and um, but even the in-person one um, as i said earlier so my promise is you spend half a day with me and you'll get back an hour a day from now on like literally immediate uh, immediate results from using AI tools like ChatGPT and other tools like it. And these are these are tools that you can use immediately. These are some of the external tools. It doesn't mean you have to implement AI through your whole organization. Um, so it's, it's not that whole um, infrastructure investment. It's using some of these tools immediately. Okay. I want to finish off with a little bit of a puzzle for you here. So have your fingers ready for the chat room. I'm going to turn share this puzzle with you and this is going to be my last message so this is something I, I remember reading as a kid in primary school so there's a pond with a lily in it one lily and what happens is overnight that lily splits in two so the first day there's one the next day there's two and then the next night both of those lilies split in two so the next day there's four eight sixteen thirty two it doubles every day Okay, so the pond doubles, the number of lilies doubles every day. And after 28 days of, of you watching it, the pond is full. So here's my question for you, and I'm going to see uh, who can get the answer right first in the chat for the glory of everybody else, uh, for, for your glory in front of everyone else. Uh, when is a pond half full? Full in 28 days, when is it half full? Thank you. Oh, Steve, oh, Sarah, sorry. Sarah, Georgina, great. 27 days, 27 days. So the correct answer, which some people have got, Richard has said that as well, 27 days. So let me show and explain that to you. So the pond fills in 28 days, and because it doubles every day, the day before that is half full, right? So this is the puzzle that I remember reading as a kid. But let me go back a little bit further. Let me extend this. So the day before that, it was a quarter full. The day before that, less again, less again, less again. At the start of that week, and remember, this is uh, week four, Okay, so this is 28 days, it's four weeks. The three weeks before that, it was almost empty. Even at the start of that fourth week, it was only about 1% full. And if, you, if you've been watching it for three weeks, the start of the fourth week, you'd be tempted to give up if you had the patience to even stay that long. But all of that growth happens in that last week. And this is exponential growth. AI grows exponentially because like a self-driving car crashes and then um, the AI is tweaked so it doesn't happen again, but it doesn't only happen in that car, it happens in every other car in the fleet. Um, social media grows exponentially because we're all connected in networks, so networks grow exponentially. A deadly virus spreads around the world exponentially, forcing lockdowns because otherwise it would get out of control. And AI in particular is growing exponentially. And I think we're right at the start of this big growth curve. In fact, it's growing now faster 
higher um, than it ever was before for two reasons. I think the curve is going to be even steeper because for two things. One is the technology is growing faster, but now because of chat GPT and other external tools, people are also adding their intelligence to make it grow even faster. So we're really at the start of this curve and I'm um, really saying, um, don't ignore it, don't neglect it, especially if you've got responsibility if you're in a leadership position. So don't wait for all your ducks to line up in a row. Don't wait for things to be perfect. Don't wait until you see evidence of other people using it maturely. Uh, so using it and you say it's mature enough for us to adopt now. Start before you're ready because it won't wait for you. Thanks everyone for joining me. If you've got any questions, comments, please uh, engage with me or my contact details at gihanperera.com. And uh, I hope you really take advantage of the possibility of AI. Thank you. And I'll see you in the future.